You guys, I am so excited about this video. Before we get into today's video, I did wanna let you guys know that this video is for entertainment purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. Good morning, my lovelies, my beauties, my friends. My name is Christina and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, thank you so much for clicking on this video. I really hope that you will subscribe, stick around, take a chance and hearing some things that I have to say. And if you are a returning subscriber, y'all already know, y'all are my babies. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all have had another wonderful, wonderful week. In today's video, I am super excited about this video. Now, by the way, I hate the way I say that. Now, I heard my grandmother the other day, I was listening to her and she says that. Have y'all ever experienced that? Have you ever like heard yourself say something or you hear something and it annoys you and then you see another person in your family do it and you're like, it's you, it's your fault I say it like that. Anyways, so in today's video, we are going to be talking about the case of Michael Taylor. This happened in 1974. Have y'all heard about this? This is over there for all my England people. Y'all have probably heard about this. It's kind of, kind of a big deal that this happened. Now let me tell you real quick why I'm so excited about doing this and why I wanted to do this. So I had heard about this story before. I've had a few of you guys send me this story before and I researched it a little bit and then kind of got off of it and forgot about it, that type of thing. But I was watching The Conjuring, the third one, and I love those movies. And I'll tell you guys why I'm not a real big scary movie type of person, but the conjurings, is it the conjuring or the conjuring? Whatever it's called. Those are all true stories. All three of them are true stories and they have real pictures of the real people at the end and you can research these situations. And I'm a very spiritual person and I find it fascinating and I also believe in it. And at the end of the third one, they talked about this case and I was like, I forgot about that. I need to do that case. So here we are. We're going to talk about the possession of Michael Taylor. And let's just start at the beginning. Michael Taylor was born on September 21st of 1944. Now I could not find a lot about Michael Taylor's childhood, barely anything, but that's okay. We'll just start with what we know. So he was born in September of 1944 and he lived over in England. Now he lived there with his wife. At this time that this took place, he was 31 years old, young guy, had his wife. Her name was Christine Taylor. She was 29 years old and they had five children and a dog. Whew, at 29 years old, girlfriend, she was busy, okay? She had things to do. They all lived in West Yorkshire and Michael was working as a butcher. Michael Taylor was described as a mild-mannered man, very polite, but boring. And not to say that if you're mild-mannered, you're boring, but that is the words that was used to describe him. He wasn't nothing too special, very nice. He was a family man, a loving father, a loving faithful husband and was just chill, laid back dude, didn't bother nobody, went to work, came home, was a dad, played with his poodle and his five kids, and that's about it. Now, during this time in 1974, England had their economic crisis and there was people, I found pictures, there was people protesting in the streets. A lot of people lost their jobs. They had trash piling up and it was just a really hard time for the people over there in England. And this as well affected Michael. See, Michael previously to this time had injured his back and because of the constant chronic pain and him working as a butcher, you know, lifting up meats and cutting and standing all day long on hard floors. It was making his back even worse. And with the economic crisis going on, jobs were very scarce. It was hard to find a job, much less now he has chronic pain he's dealing with. So therefore it was hard for him to keep a job. And he had a wife and five children and a poodle to support. So this all started to get into Michael's head and he started to fall into a bit of a depression. Now it is said that it was not a clinical depression. It was more of a, like a situational depression, which I think a lot of us can relate to. You know, he would have his really down times and his chronic pain caused him 
him to be depressed at times. And if you guys have not watched my why I have my hair locked video, go and watch it because I talked specifically about that. Any of you guys that are living with chronic pain, it gets into your mental health. It will mess with your head. So I totally understand how this 31 year old man with his 29 year old wife and five kids and a dog, depending on him to put food on the table and to pay the bills during an economic crisis where people don't have jobs and people are on strike and all of this stuff is going on on top of him having chronic pain and having to push through the pain. He was dealing with a lot. Now, also during this time in England, Christianity and faith was a big deal. Like you needed to go to church. Everybody went to church. If you didn't go to church, people was looking at you. Okay. Michael and Christine, they ain't going to church. Hmm. Wonder what they're doing. That type of thing. Well, Michael and Christine and the kids had tried to find different churches and they always found that all the churches that they went to, they were very like stiff and very repetitive, super, you know, religious practices. And they just never found a place where they fit in and felt comfortable. And so they would go every now and then just because it was the socially acceptable thing to do, but they were not devoted to any church. One day, one of their neighbors, her name was Barbara, kind of saw what was going on with Michael, saw the, the, the change in the family dynamic, knew that they were in hard times. And she went over to Michael and Christine's house and she said, listen, I have found this new little church. It is a small church. It's like a little family environment. You guys are going to love the pastor. She's a young woman and it's very vibrant and alive and charismatic and just come one time and see if it helps you out. Cause she was thinking, it would help him with his, you know, depression and, you know, getting him out of the house and being filled with some Jesus, right? Her intentions were very good. And the couple decided, what do we got to lose? We'll go check it out. Now, on the day that Christine and Michael got to this church group, it was really a, just a small fellowship group. And most of everything that went on in this church group was based on supernatural healing that is talked about in the Bible. And the leader of this group's name was Marie Robinson. She was a 21-year-old, fiery, big personality, confident in the Lord, laying hands on you, praying in tongues, charismatic. I'm going to heal you right now in the name of Jesus, blonde haired young woman. And this took the tailors a bit by surprise because again, they were used to going to like these stiff church, you know, like hallelujah. And now they're in this small fellowship group. This is 21 year old jumping up on tables, talking about casting the depression out of you in the name of Jesus. And they really were impressed by it. They took to it. They felt comfortable. And on the first night that they were there, Marie was up preaching and, you know, speaking the word of the Lord and Christine and Michael were just sitting in a pew and she got up and said, does anybody need healing? Does anybody need any healing from anything? And looking back at it, that's probably why Barbara recommended that they go to this church because she knew Michael was struggling with depression and her faith believed that they could go there and Marie could, you know, heal him through Jesus of laying on hands and speaking in tongues, heal him of this, you know, seasonal depression. Okay. So when Marie jumped up and said, Hey, who needs, who needs healing? Michael shot his hand up, honey. He was like, help me. <laughs> I don't know if he said that, but he, he shot his hands up. Well, as she pointed him out, Marie started walking towards Michael and Michael started walking towards Marie. Marie, while she was on her way to Michael, she saw a little old lady sitting in the pew, just crying with her head down, just crying, crying, crying. The little old lady's name was Mavis Smith and nobody ever found out exactly why she was crying. But Marie stopped right there on the way to Michael and put her hands on Miss Mavis and started praying and speaking in tongues over her to heal her. And Michael, who was on his way to Marie, stopped right there in the middle of the church, dropped to his knees, put his hands in the air and just started speaking in tongues. And he was speaking. If you guys have never heard somebody speak in tongues, he was just going, you know, wild with it. I, I don't know what word to describe it because it's not why, you know what I mean? He was just speaking in tongues and the whole congregation was surprised <laughs> because they've never seen anybody do that. I have actually never seen anybody do that either on their very first time in church and they just drop to their knees and start speaking in tongues. However, 
Marie thought, wow, like he is filled with the Holy Ghost. He is spiritually led. Let me get over to him. And the reason why he was actually walking up to her was not because of his seasonal depression. It was because of his back pain. He was desperately trying to get healed from his back pain because if his back pain would go away, in his mind, everything else was going to go away too. When the Taylors left that day, they were completely converted and all in so much all in that they started hosting the fellowship groups in their home. So now people are coming to their home. Marie, the leader is coming to their home and they're, they're putting on these like Bible study groups and Marie is laying hands on people and they're speaking in tongues in their home. And they're just completely devoted now to this fellowship group. However, as time continued to go on, Christine started noticing that her husband, Michael, was really extra friendly with Marie, the leader, the young 21 year old, blonde, vibrant, no children, you know, just on fire for the Lord. He started looking at her and spending more time with her than she was comfortable with. And Christine also felt like Marie, the leader, she wasn't pushing back on it. She was rolling with it with him. And as a matter of fact, it was later said that Michael and Marie would stay up all night long praying and talking about things and talking about, you know, the things of God. As far as Christine knew, they could have been talking about anything, but that's what she would say. Marie would come over and they would stay up till two, three o'clock in the morning. Marie's not up there to put all five kids to bed, fed the dog, clean the kitchen, wiping her hands on her apron, mopping the floors. And he's in there till one, two, three, four o'clock in the morning with Marie. Okay. Now first and second night, she was like, okay, I get it. Praise the Lord. By the fifth, sixth, seventh night, she's like, hold up now. You about to need Jesus, ma'am, if you don't get up out my house away from my husband. You know what I mean? No, I'm just kidding. But she started getting very, very uncomfortable with it. And it started to build in her and she was about ready to explode. During this time, also, the Taylors found out that Marie, the leader, was not just into healing people. She also had a very strong pull to the dark side of things. And by dark side of things, we're talking about like exorcisms, demonic spirits, demonic forces, all of that. And the more that they got to know Marie, they got to realize that she was really like, on fire for people that were possessed and fascinated about demons and being able to cast them out. And it is also said that Marie, this was actually kind of turning into a cult is what the rumor was, but Marie was way more impressed by the power aspect of it. I mean, everybody looked at her like she is so powerful. She can heal you. She can see demons. Demons are afraid of her. And she was allegedly, I don't know, I wasn't there, but feeding off of this power that she had. A lot of people had questions as far as demonic possession versus mental illness. And people still have those questions to this day. Well, the church back then had three ways to tell whether a person was demonically possessed or if they were just mentally ill. You know, maybe they had some schizophrenia going on. Maybe they had some delusions or hallucinations or, you know, there could be a bunch of different things that could cause people, especially back then, you know, pre-internet days and all of that good stuff to be maybe misjudged as being possessed by something when maybe they had some mental obstacles that they had to overcome. Well, the three ways that the church differentiated the two, I hope that's how you say the word differentiated. Y'all know what I mean, was supernatural knowledge. A person that is possessed by a demon versus just mentally ill is going to know things about the people around them that they should not know. Knowledge of maybe their childhood or their struggles or their secrets or their skeletons in their closet. They should have supernatural knowledge. The second thing is supernatural strength. A person that is possessed versus just mentally ill is going to have supernatural strength. I mean, you've seen it on TV. They can flip a table. They can burst chains off of them. You know, they can just do things that a average person would not be able to do. And the third way to distinguish the two, according to the church back then, was language. A person that is possessed versus a person that was just mentally ill is going to know a language or be able to speak different languages that they've never known, never 
studied, didn't know prior to the possession. So those three things, supernatural strength, supernatural knowledge, and language. There was definitely a method to what the church was doing. And I'm really glad of that because I, I always wonder those things too and wonder how they distinguish the two and they have ways to distinguish the two. Okay, let's keep going. One night while the tailors and the rest of the fellowship group were having another one of their services, that same lady Mavis, who was crying in the very beginning that I was telling you guys about, she started crying again. I mean, she was just sitting there crying to herself, just tears rolling down. And Marie jumped up and let everybody know that she needed a deliverance. She was obviously possessed by a demon and she needed a deliverance right then and there in the Taylor's home and she was going to do it. Marie started yelling at her, speaking in tongues, casting the demons out and just getting in Mavis's face in order to cast this evil out of her. When she did, Mavis, the little old lady, started thrashing and throwing herself around and growling and yelling and the people in the party held her down and Marie continued to lay hands on her and just cast the demons out of her. The more that Marie continued to lay hands on her, the more that Mavis began to growl and gnaw and try to fight and spit. Well, she eventually, Marie just moved on from her and started praying over somebody else. This freaked Christine out, okay? To her and a lot of other people in the group, this was a failed exorcism. They were like, hold up now. You're doing an exorcism or deliverance on this lady? She is still over here barking at the floor, honey. And you just left her? Like, you need to finish that. You're up in our house. I mean, I could just imagine what she was thinking. I'd have been like, excuse me, Marie, I'm gonna need you to finish this because she obviously needs you to, you know, like, but she didn't. Marie just moved on to somebody else. And so after this moment, the group all kind of started to crack because of this failed deliverance. Around this time, Michael started showing some really weird behaviors himself. He started to become terrified of the moon and, you know, just started acting weird, ways that he had never acted before. I mean, he's 31 years old. He's lived a little bit of life and his wife or his kids and his neighbor, Barbara, none of them had ever seen him be afraid of the moon or different things that was starting to surface in him. But also during this time, he was spending a lot of extra extra time with Marie, the leader. While he was spending all this extra time continuously with Marie, Christine would say, and other people that knew him would say, he went from being a loving, faithful, devoted, chill husband to very irritable, angry, not wanting to, you know, isolated from the family, that type of thing. Well, I told you guys before, Christine was already, it was building in her, honey. She was ready to absolutely explode, and that day came. One night, while they were all at a fellowship group at the Taylor's home, yet again, Christine stood straight up, honey, and she called them out in front of the whole entire group. She was like, what y'all are doing is wrong. You know, there's something going on between you guys. You need to figure it out. And like the whole group was like, oh, which they had kind of seen it too. I mean, you know how it is when you're in a group of people and you got two people that's kind of... <laughs> Oh, <laughs> everybody had seen it, but Christine was done. Okay, wasn't no calling them in private. She was letting everybody know right there in front of Jesus and everybody. Because of this, Marie and Michael were both like, you know, in shock. And Christine said that I think you two need to go upstairs together and talk it out, finish whatever you need to finish and come back down when it's done. <laughs> I'm sure she had her reasons why she did that. So the two agree. Everybody else is sitting downstairs like, mm -mm -mm. so um, what'd y'all make for dinner while the two were upstairs in the room alone? It's later said, Marie would say that when they got up in the room and closed the door, Michael tried to kiss her and she pushed him off and was like, no, this is not right. This is not of God. And it, you know, it is said that they never had any physical relationship, but that maybe Marie said, maybe they were getting too close, you know, emotionally or even spirit. I, I don't know. I wasn't there, but Marie denied ever having any kind of physical relationship with him while him being, he was married, married with five children. So they kind of talked it out and then they went downstairs. Now, when they went back downstairs with the whole group, Michael stands up in front of the whole group and is like, praise God, it's over. 
We have been healed. A miracle happened while we were up there. We overcame our passions. And everybody's in the group like, okay. Well, after that, the group continued to go on and Marie would later say, oh, I have chills thinking about it, that she saw Michael's eyes change while they were in the group. When she saw his eyes change, Marie fell back and started screaming. When she started screaming, she started just speaking in tongues like she had saw the evil in his eyes at this point. While Marie was screaming at him in tongues, Michael slapped her right across the face and went to jump on her. And the whole group jumped up and pulled him back, including his wife, Christine. They are holding him back and he is trying to go after her. Marie cowered in the corner and started saying, Jesus, 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 over and over and over again. Like she had obviously seen something that freaked her out in a way that she had never seen it before. Michael eventually came to his senses the police came and checked everything out. Everything seemed fine. The group left and it was a very awkward vibe when they left. Later, Michael would say that he felt evil take over him. He said that all he remembered was that he looked at Marie and she was completely naked. Then he looked down at himself and he was completely naked and then he blacked out. He didn't remember anything else after that. So you guys can just imagine how strange things were getting in the Taylor home. I mean, imagine Christine, the wife. Okay. Just imagine, you know, she doesn't seen her husband go through this depression. He's got this backache. She wants to go to this group to try to help him out. And then she starts seeing like this weird relationship forming between the two. And then the failed deliverance of the lady Mavis and then Marie just moves on. And then, you know, like, and then she sees her husband do something she has never seen him do before. I mean, they got five kids together. They have been through it, honey. They have, they, they've been through this economic struggle. I mean, that's her life partner. And she just seen him do something she has never seen him do before. I just can't imagine how she felt. Nevertheless, though, rumors in that town spread quickly. Michael is possessed by, did you hear that Michael slapped that young pastor lady, Marie? Now, you know, women is not supposed to be pastors. So ain't no telling what really happened. Well, I heard that Michael and Marie, they had a thing going on and the wife found out. I mean, it just, the rumors, honey, the rumors was going wild. Well, the rumors got to a certain pastor that was in this town. This specific pastor was known for his deliverance, yes, of demons. He performed exorcisms. That is what he felt like God had called him to do. And once he heard what had gone on with Michael, he knew he needed to get over there just as fast as he could and save this man from this evil spirit or spirits that were inside of him. When the pastor and the deliverance team went over to the tailors and they sat down and talked to them, Michael started telling him all kinds of stuff. He said Marie seduced him, honey, said she was trying to get with him in private and that she was really coming on to him. He also told the pastor that she was a closet Satanist and that she was actually putting demons in people instead of taking them out. And this all kind of started to make sense to people too, especially the pastor who, who does this and already kind of thought what Marie was doing was wrong. Cause see back then, and I don't know how it works now, you had to follow all these rules to do an exorcism. You couldn't just decide, hey, I'm gonna do this right here in the middle. Cause there is, you know, you can't be just, I mean, what happens when you cast a demon out? It's just flying around in the house. Like you gotta put it in something. You gotta put it back somewhere. But she just decided she's gonna jump up with Mavis and think about this, you guys. Mavis, the little old lady sitting there crying, she starts speaking in tongues and doing all this stuff. And then the lady is crawling around on the floor, throwing herself around, yelling and growling. And she leaves her like that and moves on to the next person. So everybody's going, oh my gosh, that is what she does. She is a Satanist. She's putting the demons into people instead of taking them out. We figured her out, now we know. The pastor sat there and listened and he thought, okay, okay, I believe everything you're saying. I'm gonna go see, see what I can figure out and see what I can do. Left the Taylor's homes. Michael and Barbara is like, okay, we've gotten it off our heart, our spirit, like 
were good. The Taylors started planning a vacation. They needed to get away, spend some time together with just the family and just, you know, forget about all of the mess that they had done been through. I could just imagine again, Christine, like this poor wife, like, <sighs> Well, that neighbor, Barbara, who I th still think her intentions were good, but I really get this nosy neighbor vibe from Barbara, okay? She found out that they were going on vacation and she went back to that pastor that was just at their house that they confessed all this stuff to about Marie and told him, hey, listen, I don't know if you care or anything, but the Taylors, they're getting ready to go on vacation. You know, he's got probably got a demon in him, you know, and I don't, I don't know. Where is he going to go? Is he going to go releasing different spirits? Like you might want to get over there before he leaves town. Just clean things up real quick. That way you don't go spreading his demons all over the place. So the pastor and Barbara come up with a plan. Pastor's like, you know what? You're right. I need to get my exorcism team together. We are going to take care of this once and for all with this man before he goes on vacation, then he'd go enjoy his time and rekindle his love with his wife. So they come up with this plan that Barbara is going to tell the Taylors that they need to go see that pastor just real quick before they leave. Like just, just you need to go over here real quick. It's not gonna take you long. He wants to see you, probably give you something, you know, a little bit of grape juice in a cup, put some bread on your tongue and you're going to be good. You're going to have the best vacation ever. And the Taylors are like, okay, fine. I trust this guy. Sounds good. So they get together, Christine and Michael, and they go over. Now, when they go over to where the pastor is, they did not realize that he was going to have his whole exorcism team there and pretty much ambush them. Like, you know, you need to have this. And he's like, no, I don't know. You know, I, I don't think there's anything in me. I'm fine. And they basically were just like, Yes, you need to remember you guys this is 1974 things were much different then like he had he felt like he had to go along with it and you know what maybe he did have something in him I mean he hauled off and slapped this lady so here we go we're gonna do an exorcism before we leave to go on vacation on the night of October 5th of 1974 was when it really started to hit the fan this exorcism team I got the creeps thinking about this, you guys. Started to perform an exorcism on Michael Taylor. Now, when they did, he started to seem to be possessed. He was throwing himself around. He was growling. He was punching people in the face. He had to be held down. I mean, they were throwing holy water on him. They was all taking turns, just casting it out, casting the demons out. And it is later said that they cast it out 40 times demons in Michael that night. Now they were going down the list of different demons to cast out. Okay. They cast out the demon of incest, of blasphemy, of theft, you know, of whatever, all of those demons. Okay. Well, they went at it for eight hours and then we're not talking about, we're just standing there praying for eight hours, which <sighs> have you ever sat through a five minute prayer? That feels like a really long time. Totally worth it. Totally worth it because God is amazing. We love you, Jesus. But it just feels like in our time, a very long time. Okay, we're talking eight hours of this. All while Michael is fighting them, spitting, foaming at the mouth, like really looking like he's got some demons inside of him. Well, they got too tired and the pastor said, listen, we need to finish this. I need to give my team a break. They need to go home and get a little bit of rest and we will finish it tomorrow. We only got three more demons, honey. We got three more to cast out. We done cast it out 40 and then we'll do those tomorrow. Well, those three demons that he left in were the demons of insanity, anger, and murder. Now, mind you, while they were doing these exorcisms and they were casting out these 40 demons, they were shoving, you know, crosses in his mouth. They said he was confessing to sins that he never even committed before. I don't know what they were thinking. I would love to sit down with that pastor and say like, what were you thinking when he was confessing to climbing a building with his toes and burst in a window with his forehead and he never did that? Like, I wanna know what y'all were thinking. Were you thinking it was the demons that did it and he doesn't remember? Like, I have questions. But nevertheless, I mean, this was a full on, I can't imagine how exhausted Michael's physical body was much less the other people. But when they decided to take a break until the next morning to cast out these last three demons, one of the exorcism team ladies stood up and said, listen, we need to finish this tonight because if we don't finish this tonight, Christine is going to be killed. And everybody's like, no, we've cast out 
40 of the demons, the other three demons are probably taking a nap. Like they're going to be fine until tomorrow till we get them out of here. And this lady was like, no, but listen, I have seen a vision and Christine, his wife is going to be killed if you do not cast them out for whatever reason, the rest of the team who were tired decided they were still going to take a break somehow, some way, I guess they got Michael calmed down enough to send him home with his wife, Christine. Well, Christine and Michael get back to their home. Christine gets a hold of the five children's grandparents and sends them over to the grandparents' house. That way, her and Michael can rest, get themselves together, because, I mean, they got, they got a busy week ahead of them. They got to cast out these last three demons, okay? And then they got to go on vacation. I mean, this is an exhausting event. Two hours after Christine sent the kids to their grandparents' house, something came over Michael. <sighs> he stripped completely naked and started running around the house talking, I mean, looking very possessed. Christine, who had obviously been through the ringer, is freaking out, looking at her husband, butt naked, going wild, speaking all kinds of crazy mess. And he went up to his wife, you guys, with his bare hands, reached into her mouth and pulled out her tongue, dislocated it from her body. When this happened, the blood was coming into her mouth. She fell to the ground and she began to choke on her own blood, okay? Then he reached into her eyes and gouged out her eyeballs. Then it is said that he began to rip the flesh from her face with his bare hands, slinging pieces of her face skin all over the place. At this point, she's dying. She is suffocating and drowning in her own blood because of her tongue. It is said that he had ripped so much of her skin and her face off that you could see her skull. Then he went to the dog and began to snatch the limbs off of the dog with his bare hands. He choked the dog and he pulled the tongue of the dog out and gouged the eyes out of the sockets as well. It was a bloody, horrible mess. Then he began to wander outside naked. Now he was wandering down the streets, but naked, completely covered in blood when 911 started getting calls. The calls from 911 were stating that there was a man who did not seem well that was naked, covered in red paint, wandering around outside. Well, when the cops got to him, they found Michael in the fetal position and they recognized right away that this was not paint, that this was blood. I mean, they could tell the difference immediately. And they said that while he was in the fetal position, completely covered in blood, he was screaming, this is the blood of Satan. This is the blood of Satan. They were able to restrain him and take him in. Eventually, he was put under arrest when it was found out what had happened. Um, I heard different things and read parts of like where an investigator spoke out. One of the investigators that actually went to the house, I mean, they saw him and covered in blood, but they did not know whose blood it was. Was it his blood? Was it somebody else's blood? Was it, a, you know, he was a butcher? What, 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 what was it? When they went to the house and they saw what had happened to Christine and the dog, the reports of the investigator said that this changed them forever. I just cannot imagine. And then, you know, later on when an autopsy and stuff was performed on Christine and the dog, they could tell with Christine because they couldn't find a murder weapon. I mean, the cops or the investigators in the beginning, they're looking for a murder weapon. Okay. How did he cut her tongue out? How did he, you know, scoop her, her eyes out of her head? Well, they found out later from the autopsy that it wasn't cut. He did it with his bare hands, which is a super natural, superhuman strength. I mean, people can't just do that. You, you can't, the investigators were horrified and changed forever. To make a long story short from this point, he was put into a mental hospital for evaluation and he was deemed unfit to stand trial. And then he was later found not guilty for reason of insanity. He ended up serving just four years in a mental hospital and then later being released. After that though, he didn't have like a joyous life or an easy time. He was very suicidal. It was said that he tried to take his own life many times. He injured his back even further because he jumped off of a bridge at one point and he was just never the same after that. Now, different people in court said different things. There were, you know, the church, nobody from the church was held responsible for any of this. 
After this, a bunch of rules for exorcism were put in place though. However, like probably can we finish it all the way out? You know, that one woman that was in the exorcism team came up and said, I told them that that demon of murder was gonna kill the wife and they all decided they need to go home and take a nap. Could you imagine being in court and hearing that? Like somebody needs to be held responsible too here. Like you guys, if you really believe what you're doing, okay? If you really believe this, that you were tapped into the spiritual world and I absolutely believe in the spiritual world and, and all of that, but I'm talking about them. Why in your right mind would you not finish? You know, I don't know. Try not to be too judgmental, but like, Poor Christine, that woman had went through it. However, a psychologist came up and testified in court and said, because there was two different things. There was people very much from the church and the spiritual realm that said, no, 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 this is real. This really happened. He was possessed by a demon, okay? A psychologist came up and said that what he had went through the night before with the eight hours of the exorcism and basically what they consider, the psychologists consider to be ment mental abuse, some physical abuse. I mean, shoving crosses in a person's mouth if they weren't possessed will kind of make you feel some type of way. You know what I'm saying? Like, but nevertheless, he said that he had a psychotic break because of the eight hours of mental abuse and physical abuse. And that made me think if that is true, which I don't know. However, again, you guys know what I believe. I'm not going to keep saying it over and over again. I'm not taking anything away from the spiritual realm because I know it's real. But if what he said was true, if this man had a psychotic break from eight hours of emotional, mental, and physical abuse, what does that say for children that are raised in environments where they are being yelled at and, you know, talked about and things spoken over them, you know, for years. And then they grow up and they act a certain way. What does that say about that? If what he said is true, I mean, why isn't this on every single news channel? You know what I mean? That was really made me think about it. If, if people really believe that eight hours of that would make somebody snap to the point that they gouge their wife's eyes out and rip her tongue out while she chokes on her own, drowns on her own blood for just eight hours. What about 18 years? What about two years? What about one year? I don't know. What do you guys think? You guys always give you guys my opinions at the end. I don't know. I definitely believe that this could be exactly what they say it is. I definitely believe it could have been demonic possession. I definitely believe that Marie could have been, you know, placing things in people. And then I also believe that it could have been some or underlying, you know, mental disorder. And then he snapped. I do lean more towards the spiritual side of it though. I will say that. I, I know that anything's possible, but I lean more to the spiritual side of it because one, I know it's real. It's very, 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 very real. Okay. And two, the superhuman stuff that this man did, like, I mean, it ain't every day that people are ripping tongues out of people's mouths with their bare hands. You know, that's not, it's not an everyday thing. So I am 80% that I believe he was possessed and 20% that it could have been something else. So what do you guys think? Have you heard of this story? Are you interested in hearing more of these possession stories? Because this is something that I would really enjoy talking about. Let me know in the comment section down below. Thank you guys so, so much for watching this video. I love y'all. I loved doing this video, although it was sad. I pray Christina's in heaven just eating all the good food, honey, and just chilling and just laying with the lion and the lamb. And I pray that her kids are fine and they're okay and they came back from this because it had to be very difficult. Again, thank you so, so much for watching this video, please do not forget to like it. It's a free way that you can help your girl out. And until next time, I love you guys so, so, so very much. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye. Love you guys. Bye. We are, we are dreaming in the dark. We are nothing more than dust.